Uh, so by now, we know that 181 uh, CEOs of the leading uh, U.S. companies uh, signed a statement um, that seems to move us away from the shareholder primacy for as long as that uh, um, certainly people uh, in my generation uh, receive old education seem to have uh, taken uh, for granted based on the Delaware uh, Corporation Law. So this is why tonight we are having um, these uh, discussions. And I suppose um, all of you have um, read the original uh, roundtable statement as well as uh, Senator Warren's letter. And you also noted that not only the focus is moving away from a very uh, singular uh, shareholder focus, but it seems in those documents there's also a deliberate effort of putting shareholder exactly to be the last in order. So it's after the, um, the customers, employees, suppliers, communities, and then number five um, is shareholders. So uh, I think most of the people in this audience are from, from the law schools and we understand that over 60% um, of the US corporations are organized under Delaware law. Now even setting Delaware law aside, it's exemplary of the corporation law in the US, but let's focus on the Delaware law. So for all the education that we have received, so we are at least led with the impression that the primary responsibility of fiduciary duty of the corporate management as well as the board of directors are to the welfare or benefits of the shareholders. Okay? And you know, of course we want corporate leaders to be mindful of the societal benefits of the stakeholders, but they do it in a way to ultimately benefit shareholders because you know, if, if you treat your supplies well, um, if you have a progressive views, you have a good reputation in the marketplace, eventually it benefits you. That's kind of the, the, the view that we are taking. So that's why the first question I want to ask the two panelists that, are we going to change the law? Okay, since we're repurposing the corporation, are we really going to have a substantive modification of the corporation law, or are we reinterpret the law? Are we is this reinterpretation going to be an accurate description of the law or desirable interpretation of the law? So I think I will just start with a question as follows and later we'll follow on. So I don't know which one of you would like to start first. Well, I'm closer to you, so, okay. so, so I'll, I'll, I'll take the first crack at it. Um, it is an interesting, the corporate governance sits at the, at the intersection of law, finance and management and mm -hmm. politics. And it's an interesting question to ask whether the business roundtable statement is an intervention in the legal debate, is an intervention in the management theory uh, or finance debate, or is an intervention in the political debate. As a matter of Delaware corporate law, it seems to me pretty clear that Delaware is and remains, and I expect will remain, what you might call a shareholder primacy state. But I want to be clear as to what that means, because it doesn't mean as much as some people think, and it doesn't mean what I think the people who attack shareholder primacy take shareholder primacy to be. I view the question of the, obj the objective of the corporation to be, a, to be a question about this enterprise form that has existed for more or less the last 150 years as a form for conducting business and has proved to be an incredibly flexible as well as wealth generating form. It's used in a dizzying array of different contexts. It u it's used for the public corporation. It's used for privately held corporations. It's used for wholly owned subsidiaries. It's used for mutual firms. It's used for uh, single purpose, for special purpose vehicles. The same enterprise form is used for a variety of different uses. So I take the question to be, I interpret the question of what is the objective of the corporation to be a question of what is the best theory of this enterprise form and not a question of how you build, the, the legal question is not a question of how you build great businesses. It's a question about the legal form. And from that perspective, it seems to me not indisputable because people I respect dispute this, but it seems to me clear that it is an accurate description of that legal form that the corporation is operated, that the object of the corporation is to promote the value of the corporation for the 
ultimate benefit of the shareholders. And you see that first and foremost from the corporate statute. And this is true about the Delaware statute and true about many other statutes. Only shareholders get to vote for, for directors. Only shareholders get to sue to enforce fiduciary duties. Okay? When a corporation is dissolved, the shareholders get what's left over after everybody else has been paid off. When you look at the case law, you see the same thing. In the, at the moments where the interests of different stakeholders diverge, such as the sale of a company for cash, where for the shareholders, there is no long-term left, but for the employees there is, for the suppliers there is, and so forth. At that point, Delaware is clear in the Revlon case that the duty of the board is to act as an auctioneer and to receive the highest value reasonably available for the shareholders. Likewise, as people have been dissatisfied with shareholder primacy, the new statutes have been passed, including in Delaware. So now Delaware has, has a public benefit corporation section, which provides an explicit way in which, in which firms can opt out of the shareholder primacy view and commit to other goals. For the day-to-day -day management of the business, Delaware doesn't interfere and shareholder primacy is not an issue. The business judgment rule protects the kind of flexibility that management needs in order to organize all the uh, inputs in the firm in a productive way, and its decisions, so long as they're disinterested, will not be second-guessed. But at the boundary points, such as the sale of the company, Delaware has been crystal clear that the duty of the board is to, is to maximize the value of the corporation for the shareholders. <clears throat> So, so I um, uh, agree with, with all of what, um, what Ed Rock has said. Um, I, I want to add a, a somewhat different gloss. And that is um, the uh, um, discretion that the board has under the law to balance the interests of the stakeholders, except at the moment when the firm is sold in which, in the circumstance in which the firm is sold for cash, then as Ed says, uh, the conflicts, if any, are resolved in favor of the shareholders. But that's the, the outlier case, not the, uh, the management over time case. So, so it's pretty clear that as a legal matter, uh, the, the directors have, management directors have got a great deal of discretion in any serious case to balance off the interests of many different parties. And of course, uh, if, if when they adopt measures doing whatever they do, they're always going to frame it in terms of creating value for the firm and the shareholders over the long term. And uh, in effect, the structure of the business judgment rule says that in cases except where there's uh, the directors have a personal conflict with the actions taken, uh, no court will upset or find basis for liability in the balance that might be struck um, under that rationale. Um, but but the, the legal fr framework has different impact on the ground, conditional on background ownership of the firm, that is to say the nature of the ownership of the firm. So in the, the, the what some think is the good old days of the 50s and the 60s, the shareholders were highly dispersed. So in effect, the, the collective action barriers to concerted shareholder action meant that directors had enormous discretion uh, to strike whatever balance they wanted and also to pursue whatever business plans they wanted. And, and the accountability um, for success in whatever balance they struck and how successful they were with the business 
the accountability was rather, was rather um, muted precisely because the parties with governance rights, the shareholders were diffuse and collective action uh, issues made it very hard for them to, to do anything other than if they didn't like how the firm was run to sell the shares, the so-called the Wall Street rule. Ownership now has dramatically changed. And, you know, later on I'll explain a little bit about why that has occurred. But now, uh, for large firms, 70 or more percent of the shares are held by a relatively large, uh, a, a relatively small group of institutional owners. What that means is that the collective action barriers to concerted sh shareholder action, if they do not like the way management directors has acted on behalf of the shareholders, those collective action costs have gone to very small. And what the, the, the activist sh shareholders do, the activists, the hedge funds do, where they see gaps between how the firm is run and what would ma maximize from the shareholder po point of view, in effect, they activate the latent governance rights that these now reconcentrated -con owners have. So the point being that under the identical legal frame framework, which um, gives the directors enormous discretion how to balance the interest and how to conduct the business and affairs of the firm, the change in the nature of ownership has, has uh, squeezed out, as it were, that discretion. And so I think some of, the, some of the moment that we now see is because, although the legal rule hasn't changed, uh, the implications on the ground have changed because of the way ownership has meant that governance rights under the statute, which really haven't changed as a legal matter, governance rights now have real impact and therefore the discretion, in fact, for directors to balance um, has also um, uh, thinned out as well. Let me follow up on that because I think that's an interesting point. Uh, over the last 150 years, the corporate form has been used for all sorts of businesses in very different capital markets with very different distribution of shareholding, with privately held firms of enormous size, with publicly held firms with dispersed ownership, with publicly held firms with controlling shareholders. It's all been the same legal form. How the participants in that legal form figure out how best to uh, allocate power among themselves and allocate decision-making rights obviously goes to really the second issue, which is how to build great companies and how in building great companies to control the conflicts of interest that are pervasive. That's going to change. And what I, I, I agree with Jeff that what has triggered the current anxiety over what is referred to often in a derogatory way as shareholder primacy is nothing to do with, in some respects, the law. The law hasn't changed. The enterprise form hasn't changed. It's the world that's changed. And it's, it's the, the uh, legacy of, two th of the financial crisis of 2008 that has left people feeling that something needs to change. It's been the change in the capital markets with the reconcentration of shareholding. The law, however, has remained pretty constant. And the question then is, in some respects, I think the question to ask is, what is this, this arguing about the law doing that you see perhaps in the business roundtable statement, if it's a statement about the law? Why is an argument about the law the argument people are making now when what the complaint is, is either about the way firms are being run or is about the gains, how the gains from the productivity are being shared? So um, I definitely want to follow on that. I think you know the law is the same law, but the world around us um, has changed. I think we are um, brought here today to discuss such a matter is because it's a widespread um, belief um, that the economic growth has failed the majority of the population because it failed to bring about a mass um, prosperity that we would hope for. So the relevant question would be, um, 
is the behavior of corporations, especially the extremely successful corporations responsible for the lack of mass prosperity that we hope um, uh, to be happening? And is shareholder primacy per se responsible for this outcome? So uh, we think about uh, who the shareholders are. Now, um, in the US, about half of the households own any stock, could be directly or through mutual fund. But really, it's a top 1% um, in terms of the wealth, not income, but top 1% of the households own about 45% um, of the stocks. So that's the type kind of concentration that we're talking about. So the fear is that if we emphasize on shareholder primacy, then is it really only benefit a very uh, small minority? Um, of the society instead of having a natural process of spreading the game around uh, a wider uh, spectrum. So my question um, uh, becomes, yes, the world is changing and how would the corporate uh, deal with um, the difficulty or challenge in spreading around the game from the very successful business, especially in today's world when we prof profitability wise, we are adding a historical peak, but mass prosperity is not quite coming along. Mm -hmm. I'll let you take the first crack at that. <coughs> uh, it's a difficult question. Um, f uh, so uh, I want to respond in, in, in two ways. Um, um, first, you know, there there is a difficult data question, which 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 way Connor referred to, but and I'm curious afterwards to find out where, where she got the number. The question, I, I mean, one, I mean, in my own research, I'm trying trying to figure out basically if. Uh, the S and P goes up by ten percent. Who who benefits? How how? I mean, in other words, if you were to focus on the increase in share shareholder value as a good thing, what is in fact uh, the impact in uh, the allocation of those gains across folks? Right, because we know that pension funds are heavily invested in stock markets because uh, they are looking to be able to pay off uh, the pensions that they committed to in 401ks. Uh, and so public pl uh, plans, um, firm-specific plans, for 401ks, you know, those are basically held by civilians, not by the very rich. Um, endowments benefit, Columbia's. Um, uh, insurers basically uh, invest also for the middle class. So um, exactly what is the incidence of gains associated with an increase in uh, the market themselves? And so afterwards I'm going to follow up about where that 45 percent figure is coming from, you know, because, hmm? because it's very hard to figure out. I haven't been able to figure it out. And anyway, putting that aside, Right. So, so, yeah, I mean, and, and putting my own card cards on the table, I think the, the corporate governance debate is a um, um, it's a sideshow to anything that really matters, either for prosperity or for the ach achievement of important social ends, like addressing. Uh, uh, climate change risk or um, inequality or many other things. It's a sideshow and um, ought to be understood as such. So going back to this ownership pattern that I've described, um, so, and this is how legal theory filters its way, not legal theory, but finance theory filters its way into the real world. So uh, 70 years ago, economists came, uh, who won a no Nobel Prize ca came up with the idea of modern portfolio theory, that what investors care about is not only um, efforts to, to max maximize expected returns, but also to minimize risk. Um, they're looking for risk-adjusted returns. 
How do you achieve that? You achieve that by investing through a portfolio. Um, what's happened since that theory was developed is we now have mechanisms, mutual funds, in which at a very low cost, people can invest, um, uh, can obtain a very low cost diversified portfolio of firms. What does that mean? It means firms are going to be run differently today than they were before A, this discovery, and B, the operationalization of the discovery through diversified investment pools. Meaning that um, investors are told and managers are told, investors do not want to diversify at the firm level, but rather they want to diversify at the portfolio level. So you, when you think about how to set up your firm and run the firm, you don't have to worry about diversification, a conglomeration of the firm. You don't have to worry about um, uh, avoiding risk taking at the firm level because investors are going to be achieving diversification, they're going to be achieving risk reduction through holding your shares in a portfolio. All right. So the, the fundamental point of this ownership structure change is what I see as a great risk shift against employees and in favor of the shareholders and everybody else. Managers can adjust to the change in uh, the riskiness of the individual firm because they can get stock, stock options. Creditors can adjust because they insist on, on higher rates of interest and other protective terms. The employees who are not diversified because their investment is with this specific firm, they, they, cannot, they cannot adjust to the greater risk that has resulted from the way that ownership has changed in effect the way we run firms. And that, to me, is, is the fundamental issue that we, uh, from an economic insecurity point of view, are struggling with. It means that firms cannot provide thick insurance, social insurance, about you know, the preservation of income um, because they're competing in certain ways. Um, and, and so this idea that we used to have about firms in the 1950s, and that pre performed some, sort of some of the intellectual baseline for what we're now seeing now in, in you know, the business roundtable statement, doesn't match either the economic reality in which U.S. firms need, need to compete, but also doesn't take account of the way that ownership itself has, has led to the, way, the different way that firms are running themselves. So my own, again, my own point is, is that if you're concerned about economic insecurity, then different forms of social insurance become very important. If you're concerned that wages are too, too low, then, you know, laws, uh, minimum wage laws become very important. Um, and, and counting on governance to solve any serious thing, like how firms should try to mitigate a, a sort of a climate change risk, is, is just placing too heavy a load on a mechanism that um, um, just is not going to deliver uh, the strong social results that we want. So corporate governance may be a sideshow, but it's our. It's our our show. Show. <laughs> we get paid salaries to so, pretend so that it is. It's not just ahead. our side show, but it's and a politically. Ed is, Ed is the reporter of the ALI <laughs> restatement. Of so I have a particular stake in this side show. Exactly. Uh, but it's also a politically salient side show. I agree with that. And that's one reason why the focus has been on it. But the focus, the big change, as, as Jeff points out, is not on the corporate law side. The big change is in the reconcentration of shareholdings and the identity of the shareholders. So two things have happened that have transformed the, the landscape. The first is because of modern portfolio theory and various other things, the way we fund pensions and other things, 
that right now, in most public companies, the three biggest shareholders will be, in some order, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street. They won't own the stock, but they will manage it. And so in most public companies, 20% of the shares will be controlled by those three firms. You expand it to the top 10 shareholders, and you often get up to 50. That's item one. Item two is that a bunch of folks have started funds. They call them activist hedge funds, where they've taken focused positions on the order of 5 to 10 percent in companies where they think that a change will increase stock value. The two go together because the reconcentration of shareholding has meant that in any dispute, any real dispute over corporate strategy between management and a, and a hedge fund, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, Fidelity, Cap, Capital Group, a few others, are the de facto, the presumptive deciders of those. The hedge funds could not succeed if they were trying to, if the shareholding was completely dispersed. And on those, on those issues, they lobby. Management lobbies BlackRock. They come up the elevator. They make their presentations. The hedge funds do the th same thing. And in the 20 or so issues that come to a vote every year between 10 and 20, those, those are the deciding votes. And as far as I can tell, there are lots of people who think who have all sorts of plans for, for what BlackRock should do and what Vanguard should do. As far as I can tell, on those 10 or 20 votes, they decide as well as anybody could decide. They, they have the resources to examine it. The effect of that is that in the 200 or 300 engagements between hedge funds and firms, the implicit threat is that if we don't come to some agreement, we can bounce this up to a proxy contest where they're going to decide. And the result of that is there's now a whole ecosystem of people who tell companies how BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street think about issues, and other advisors who say, you have to be an activist before the activists show up, otherwise you'll be targeted. And there's a whole variety of investment decisions. Some people think it's a good result, some people think it's a bad result, but everybody agrees there's a whole set of investment decisions now made at the firm level in the shadow of a proxy, of a potential proxy contest against the backdrop of what people interpret the views to be of the largest shareholders. The power is in the shareholders. The business judgment rule doesn't bind. The, the structure of corporate law doesn't bind. It's this new political, corporate political reality that the power has shifted from the boardrooms into the shareholders. And the concern people have and the short-termism concern that one often hears is not a concern about the 10 or 20 issues that go to a proxy contest every year and that BlackRock, Vanguard, or State Street are among the deciders. It's what happens in the shadow of that. It's what happens when firms decide we will invest in a more transparent, more easily conveyed, more easily understood project rather than in a longer term, harder to explain project, because this is what we believe our shareholders want. So-called managing to the market. That's the bad side. The good side is much more efficient capital allocation. And what the balance is between managing to the market versus efficient capital allocation is what determines how people ultimately come out. I think the balance is probably towards more efficient capital allocation, but I have no, nothing other than priors mm -hmm. to, to uh, intuitions because what you can't see are the projects that were foregone because of a concern about what the shareholders might say. And figuring out, and this now the political governance and management debate becomes, how do you get the shareholders to be in favor of the right things, to be in favor of the appropriate sort of gain sharing at the firm level so that we can move forward. And there you run into a different set of laws. You run into fiduciary duty law. 
that when BlackRock takes on uh, assets to manage on behalf of one of their clients, the first question is, what does the client want? What are they asking BlackRock to do? This isn't up to BlackRock. And when it comes to the, the large index, indexed assets they manage, they've got actual customers who have money in there who have various plans. And so there's this cottage industry of telling the largest shareholders how they should vote, what they should push for. They should push for less political spending, more, bigger, bigger share for the, the workers and so forth that run directly against the fiduciary obligations that BlackRock has taken on to its investors. The problem, and here we get, I think, ultimately to where the business roundtable comes in. The problem is, with the populist upsurge that since 2008, the question is whether this current system is politically sustainable and whether the private solutions to, 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 to push towards gain sharing that is more politically acceptable are possible or whether it's going to be, whether uh, mandatory regulation is going to be called for and will be the solution. Whether to look after the interests of employees or to look after, to, to, to handle climate change, threats of climate change or to give for instance, employees more of a voice on the board through some version of co-determination, such as Elizabeth Warren's Accountable Capitalism Act, under which for companies with sales in excess of a billion dollars a year, which is a good chunk of the S&P 500, employees will elect 40% of the directors. Let me just uh, sort of follow up a little bit. Um, so. Um, how has the Business Roundtable statement changed the, what was thought to be the standard account before and whether would the change uh, address maybe the first order issues? So, so basically the Business Roundtable statement uh, is part of a broad corporate governance guide guidelines. The most recent version is 2016 but it uh, um, ratifies a statement, I think, is what, 1997? Seven, right. So, so point eight in their major things, in making decisions, the board may consider the interest of all of the constituencies, including st stakeholders such as employees, et cetera, and, and a community. When doing so, contributes in a direct and meaningful way to building long-term value creation. Um, the implication of which, uh, for the, uh, the long-term value creation of which the shareholders are the, ben the ultimate beneficiaries. The new letter, which is just statement, it doesn't, it's not a corporate governance uh, thing, it's a statement in effect just lists the various goals or the various uh, commitment to all the stakeholders and it lists the stakeholders delivering value to the customers which every firm is going to be doing all the time anyway that's how they remain in business investing in employees which again is part of the standard thing firm always say dealing fairly and ethically with suppliers, well, presumably suppliers who think they're not dealt with in that way are going to stop being counterparties. Um, supporting communities in which we work, that too is part of the standard rhetoric. Um, generating lo long-term value for the shareholders, period, stop. So the, the change, if there is a change, is the absence of a commitment to filter the considerations associated with the stakeholders um, through the lens of building long-term long value which presumably inures to the shareholders. And you know one, one first order question is whether this is window dressing completely, whether it's cheap talk because they make, as you saw in the Warren letter that we sent out, they make zero commitments here, right? 
and she calls them on that. But of course, this is a statement written by a committee of CEOs, signed and intended to be signed by all members of the business roundtable. Uh, they got 181, so it can be read as entirely uh, agnostic on the question of whether ultimately it has to be done for shareholders, or it can be read as entirely consistent with the old time religion, with shareholder primacy. Uh, and one of the signers is Larry Fink, who is now very well known for his annual letters, where he has discussed the importance of corporations having a purpose and serving their customers. And in the first version of this letter, which was interpreted by some as a rejection of shareholder primacy, uh, State Street, a competitor, uh, almost immediately came out with a series of statements and sort of an ad campaign saying that at State Street, we're about value, not values. Not surprisingly, in Larry Fink's next letter, he made it crystal clear that from the BlackRock perspective, the way to build great companies is for a company to have a purpose, and that's what, why shareholder value increases. That, Bla that BlackRock, in response or in, uh, in, in clarification, made clear that they, too, were of the view that the way you build great companies and increase shareholder value is by delivering value to customers, investing in employees, dealing fairly with suppliers, supporting communities. And that's how you generate long-term value. So as a, as, a statement, as a statement either affirming or denying shareholder primacy, it is brilliantly unclear. So first, uh, let me um, clarify. So what I meant earlier is that in the US, um, the private wealth concentration is very high. So in the private wealth space, the top 1% owns over 40%. And in terms of the concentrated financial wealth is even higher. That doesn't mean 40% of stocks are owned by the top 1%. So it's about private wealth concentration. No, no, but this is, I mean, but this so, is, I mean, for, um, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the point is that I think the concern is because of the concentration, there's a concern that successful, ben uh, successful corporations disproportionately benefit the wealthy rather than uh, increase the proportional lift for everybody. But obviously the pension funds, the 401k, they also invested, um, endowment funds invest in stock markets. So in that sense, there is a general uh, trickling down um, um, process.